Lecture 10, International Markets. Economics is an evolving discipline, and there are many issues upon which economists disagree. So it's notable when any assertion is met with universal acceptance. The principle that voluntary trade creates wealth is one of those assertions. Although you'd never know it by observing the ongoing and often heated debates over trade policy, voluntary trade creates wealth is neither a new nor an untested idea. It's been clearly understood, analyzed, and dissected by economists since Adam Smith clearly articulated the proposition in The Wealth of Nations in 1776. In simplest terms, voluntary trade creates wealth by getting goods and services into the hands of the people who value them most, a process you can illustrate with the classic, easy-to-run, never-fail classroom simulation known colloquially as the bag game. FTE's version of the bag game is called the magic of markets, and you should have watched the 10-minute video demonstration before beginning this lecture. If you haven't, take a moment to switch over to the video and then return here. As we start this topic with the bag game in mind, I want to emphasize the connections to earlier lessons and to our focus on institutions. Two rules of the game must be in place for the bag game to work and create wealth. First, the trade must be voluntary. If it is, then exchanges will only take place if there is the perception of mutual benefit, which is econ speak for saying that both trading partners think that they will be better off after they exchange. Second, note the property rights in the bag game. The traders could exchange because they owned the items in their bags and their property rights included the right of transfer. As the activity illustrates, trade increased well-being in the room even though nothing new was produced or added. Adam Smith realized, however, that one of the natural consequences of trade was that more would be produced. Voluntary trade allows, actually it's stronger than allows, it encourages specialization and division of labor. Division of production tasks into component parts lowers production costs and increases output, a process that Smith illustrated through his famous example of the pin maker, which you'll read in the lesson materials after this lecture. As a worker's task narrows, he gains from not having to switch between tasks, but also from experience that improves his efficiency in his specialty, which increases production even more. Smith also realized that bigger markets were better, or to put it in his terms, Specialization and division of labor are limited by the extent of the market. Translation, the more people you have to trade with, the better. You could even see that result in the very small classroom market created in the simulation. And common sense says it must apply to the larger world too. So why don't we trade with everybody, that is? That's really the question, isn't it? If economists agree that trade creates wealth and more trade creates more wealth, why don't we trade with anyone and everyone? And why do media personalities rant and protesters disrupt trade meetings? Let's start looking for answers by considering a common bumper sticker and campaign slogan, Buy America. Sure, it's emotionally packed, but if you can get past the lump in your throat, it's easy to illustrate the general ill logic of that proposition. So imagine this conversation. Buy American? Why should we do that? Answer, well, like, because if we buy American goods, then more American workers have jobs. Okay, so I live in Colorado, and we have a program here called ABC, Always Buy Colorado. So that must be a good thing, too, because it keeps jobs in Colorado, right? Right, I guess. So, since I actually live in Denver, I should start my own ABD, Always Buy Denver, a campaign to help out Denver workers, right? You can see where we're going with this. From Always Buy Denver, to Always Buy My Neighborhood, to Always Buy My Street, to make it all by myself. And then, we're right back to Laura Ingalls Wilder and Little House on the Prairie. And we don't want to be Laura Ingalls Wilder and live in the Little House on the Prairie. It might sound romantic, but if you read the whole series of books, 
You'll remember that the Wilders jumped at the chance to move closer to town and be part of a bigger trading community. So, both the logic and the evidence tell us that specialization and division of labor, which are made possible by trade, grow the economic pie. And growing the economic pie was where we started way back in the first lesson of EOFT Part 1. And yet, while none of us, with a few off-the-grid exceptions, want to be self-sufficient as individuals, and while we're willing to transfer that logic to accept unencumbered trade between cities and states, we seem to hit a mental barrier at our national boundaries. We just kind of have a feeling that being self-sufficient as a nation is somehow desirable. So let's go back and begin at the beginning with our economic reasoning propositions to figure out whether it is desirable. So proposition one, people choose. Okay, right away, we run into one of the big misconceptions about trade. Cities, states, nations, governments, whatever, don't trade. People do. People make choices to exchange based on their perceptions of the costs and benefits of doing so. Countries and nations set trade policies that constrain or enable the trades of their citizens, but the countries themselves don't trade. And it turns out that it doesn't matter where the trading partners are. The decisions made by the people engaged in international trade are not fundamentally different from the decisions made by people trading with someone on the next block in another city or from another state. If people are trading voluntarily, it's because both parties to the exchange perceive that they will be better off. Okay, then the next economic reasoning step is proposition number two, which tells us that people's choices, including their trade choices, have opportunity costs. And we know that because we're self-interested, rational economic beings, we try to keep our opportunity costs as low as possible. When we apply this economic reasoning tool to voluntary trade, it prompts us to ask the question, how do we know what to specialize and trade in so that we can keep our opportunity costs low? Like the question of whether we should trade or be self-sufficient, this isn't a new question. The classical economists of the 18th century, most notably David Ricardo, wrestled with how we determine who should specialize in what in order to get the most benefit from trade. And, Thanks to David Ricardo, we have both a clear guideline for answering that question, the principle of comparative advantage, and one of the most difficult counterintuitive concepts to teach. The principle of comparative advantage says that people should specialize in producing that product for which they have the lowest opportunity cost. Now that seems simple enough until we throw in the kicker. The production for which you have the lowest opportunity cost isn't necessarily the production you do best. Best, in fact, doesn't have anything to do with it. Here's how it works. First, note that comparative advantage has no meaning if you don't have a trading partner. Sure, you can figure out the opportunity cost of two alternative things you could produce, but then what? If you want them both, you can't specialize in one or the other. You have to have someone to trade with. So here's Zach the garbage man. In a given time period, Zach can empty 100 trash cans into the truck, or he can drive the truck 10 miles. We can easily figure out Zach's opportunity cost for each task. If he empties 100 trash cans, he gives up 10 miles of driving. So the opportunity cost of emptying a tr one trash can is 10 divided by 100, or one-tenth of a mile of driving. If, on the other hand, he drives 10 miles, he gives up emptying 100 trash cans. So, the opportunity cost of driving 1 mile is 100 divided by 10, or 10 trash cans. Okay, so what do we know now about what Zach should specialize in? Hello, remember? Nothing, because we don't have anything to compare it to. But here's Zeke. He can empty... 50 trash cans in a day, or he can drive the trash truck 7.5 miles. Zeke, as you can see, used to be a carpenter, and he just got his commercial license, so he's still working on that backing up the truck stuff. 
All right, so let's do some calculations for Zeke. The opportunity cost for him to dump one trash can is 7.5 divided by 50, or 0.15 miles of driving. The opportunity cost for Zeke to drive one mile is 50 divided by 7.5, or 6 and 2 thirds trash cans. Now we've got something to compare, so we can figure out how they should specialize. Zach's opportunity cost for each mile of driving is 10 trash cans, while Zeke's is only 6 and 2 thirds trash cans. Zach's opportunity cost for emptying one trash can is 1 tenth of a mile of driving, but Zeke's is 0.15 miles of driving. So our opportunity cost analysis says Zach should drive and Zeke should empty the cans into the truck. The math's clear, but where people get hung up is thinking that they'd be better off without trade. Because after all, look at Zach. I mean, he does both tasks better. So it seems like he should do the whole job himself and be self-sufficient. This is the counterintuitive part. Because what David Ricardo taught us is that we're better off to trade even if we can do both things better than our trading partner. So let's see if that's true. Is more trash collection produced if Zach and Zeke trade than if they try to be self-sufficient? Here's production for one day for Zach. He spends half the time driving and half the time emptying cans. 50 cans in 5 miles. Here's production for one day for Zeke. He spends half his time driving and half the time emptying 25 cans in 3.7 miles. Working independently, that would be two full days of work, they drive a total of 8.75 miles and they empty 75 of the 100 trash cans on the route. But now what happens if they trade their driving and can emptying skills? Remember that Zach is going to be the driver and Zeke is going to be the can emptier. Zeke can only empty 25 cans working by himself. But with Zach driving, he can empty 50 cans per day. So over two days, Zach can drive the entire 10 miles and 100 cans can be emptied. Simplified answer here is that if they exchange, they can complete the tra trash route in two days. Working independently, they couldn't. It would take them more than two days. And notice something else here too. Zach could have driven 20 miles which makes him consider whether to hire someone else to help Zeke dump the cans and expand his trash route. Now, important thing here. Note that the comparative advantage is not one person over another, but one task over another for each person. Zach doesn't have a comparative advantage over Zeke. He has a comparative advantage in producing driving over producing emptying trash cans when and only when he's working with Zeke. We often hear sloppy use of the comparative advantage terminology, and it contributes to that misconception that international trade is rivalrous rather than cooperative endeavor. It's inaccurate to say we have a comparative advantage over some other country. Instead, we have a comparative advantage in the production of good A versus good B when we exchange with any particular trading partner. The other misconception we fall into is that comparative advantage is some static or absolute thing, and it's not. All sorts of factors can change comparative advantages. In our Zeke and Zach example, what if they buy a new trash truck with computerized controls and Zeke's had computer training and Zach hasn't? It changes the relative opportunity costs, and it may change who drives and who dumps cans. This phenomenon of increased output through specialization doesn't suddenly disappear when we jump from talking about Zeke and Zach to talking about Dr. Smith in the United States and Indira Praha who reads x-rays for him in Bangalore. Specialization lowers production costs and market prices for traded goods. Everywhere. 
Trade based on comparative advantage increases production and raises incomes and standards of living. So what's the problem? Are all the talking heads, trade protesters, and congressmen who vote for trade restrictions just stupid? Well, tempting as it might be to say yes and just dismiss the problem that way, it's not an argument designed to win many converts. Think back to my example about Dr. Smith and his x-ray tech in India. Did you notice how I jumped from an individual example of people trading to generalizations about economies as a whole? We've said that specialization in trade makes production costs and market prices fall, production increases, and standards of living rise. That's true for the economy as a whole. But it's not true for Mario Johnson, who used to read x-rays and transcribe medical reports for Dr. Smith, and who lost his job when Dr. Smith's HMO outsourced, that is, traded, with Indira Praha. Economic change creates winners and losers, even if the economic change is beneficial overall. Part of the problem is that Mario Johnson losing his job is much more visible than the 0.00005% decline in the price of medical services. The costs are much more visible to us than the benefits, and we react to them more strongly. It doesn't do a lot of good to tell Mario to just relax because there's never been a time in history when the number of jobs has shrunk. The number of jobs is always growing, and it grows faster through trade as the economy grows. Good to know, but not a lot of help to all the Mario Johnsons who right now don't have jobs. And truth to tell, I don't think this is one of those things where educating people so that they understand the benefits of trade based on comparative advantage is going to make them stop and say, oh, okay then, I understand why I lost my job. That's all right. The reality is they may have to find or create for themselves a new comparative advantage, and that's not an easy process. Also, remember Lesson 8, where we talked about incentives in government? It would probably be naive of us to think that educating politicians about the benefits of trade would keep them from voting for trade restrictions. We have to be aware of those issues, but they don't change what the evidence tells us. Trade creates wealth, and nations with freer trade create wealth faster. If we want to help people hurt by economic change, we have to be careful not to destroy the engine of growth in the process. An interesting addendum to this argument is the case of China. The explosion of economic growth that followed the opening of Chinese markets and trade in the late 20th century tells us that trade can provide benefits to poor populations even as they continue to live under repressive regimes. And that's pretty impressive. Where are we in the United States? Well, despite persistent agricultural subsidies, U.S. international trade is relatively free. And while certainly not without problems, it continues to be a source of economic growth and rising living standards. Now, earlier we asserted that international markets and international trade are fundamentally the same as domestic markets and domestic trade. And having established the basis for that claim, let's move on to look at some of the differences, because there are differences. One of the most important, in both magnitude and type, is the transaction costs of exchange across national borders. The logistics of transportation, transfer, warehousing, border inspections, and verifications of compliance with trade agreements or health and environmental policies all add to the costs of exchange. While the exchanges obviously wouldn't continue at the higher transaction cost were the benefits not greater, it's nonetheless true that reducing those costs would increase the benefits of trade. The lesson from that is that not all trade agreements are of equal value in encouraging trade and growth. If they are encumbered by rules and regulations that raise transaction costs, they may actually reduce the volume of trade. Sometimes, trade agreements create very visible, concentrated, and or short-term benefits, while ignoring the less visible, more widespread long-term costs. Check back in Lesson 8 again for a review of the dynamics of how concentrated benefits and diffuse costs tend to shape government policies. In the trade arena, this most frequently shows up in policies that benefit import-competing industries 
while imposing additional and largely unseen costs on export industries and higher prices on consumers. Another large transaction cost in international exchange is currency conversion. Exchange rates in currency markets reflect the relative purchasing powers of national currencies and the international demand and supply of those currencies. The foreign currencies and foreign exchange video linked in the lesson guide demonstrates a quick classroom simulation in which students experience a currency market. It helps them visualize what is largely an invisible process. Going through the hassle of currency conversion brings home the advantages to the United States of having all 50 states share a common currency. If you're a history teacher, you'll remember that currency and trade problems led to the Annapolis Convention of 1786 and eventually to the Constitution creating a national currency. In a modern example, one of the purposes of the European Monetary Union is to lower exchange costs through a common currency. Now, we should also mention that there are costs to having a common currency, costs that seem negligible to the United States but plague the European Union, including the cost of loss of control over banking and, very importantly, over their monetary policy. But, so far at least, they've not proven to outweigh the benefits. In the last part of this lecture, we'll look at two features of international trade that, for want of a better term, I'm going to call mechanics. International exchange rates and the balance of trade are frequent features of media reporting, and discussion would definitely benefit from more precise use of terms and better knowledge of the processes. First, let's look briefly at the strong dollar, weak dollar comparison, and then we'll turn to balance of payments accounting. How much is a dollar, or any currency, worth in international trade? Currency exchange rates emerge from international currency markets, and the rates rise and fall with changes in the supply of and demand for any particular currency. When you exchange money, you are essentially using your currency to buy the currency of the country you're visiting or ordering products from, and the price you pay rises and falls with changes in supply and demand, just like in the market for blue jeans or gasoline or soda. If, for example, there's a growing supply of American dollars and not many demanders, those demanders of American dollars will pay a lower price. They'll give up relatively less of their currency to purchase the American currency. Just as in the market for products, if the demand for American dollars increases, and the supply stays the same, the demanders can expect to pay more of their currency to get American dollars. Now, the convention in international trade is that exchanges are made in the currency of the seller. So, an American importer of French wine pays for the wine in euros, which means that he first has to purchase the euros. The exchange rate will determine just how much French wine his American dollars will be worth. So let's say that the price of this bottle of wine is 100 euros. If the importer can buy a euro for 50 cents, he'll pay $50 for the bottle of wine. But if he has to pay $2 to purchase a euro, the 100 euro bottle of wine will cost him $200. The bottle of wine is still the same bottle of wine, and in fact, its price in euros didn't change, did it? But the change in the value of the dollar means that the cost to the importer has changed. The terms strong dollar and weak dollar are often used by the media very generally, but to be accurate, they refer to the value of the dollar relative to a particular other country's currency. In the news, you might hear, the dollar is stronger today than a year ago but the term is precisely used only with reference to another currency. So it should be the dollar strengthened against the euro this month. While it's not uncommon that a currency will be weak or strong against many other currencies, it is possible for it to be strong in comparison to one currency and weak in comparison to another. So we need to be specific about what the other currency is. A strong dollar 
can command a large amount of another country's currency in the international exchange, and a weak dollar can command only a smaller amount. Now, notice in our example that a weaker dollar also means a stronger euro. Okay, that's not so confusing. The confusion arises when we try to equate strong with good and weak with bad, because the answer to the question of are we better off with a strong dollar or a weak dollar is it depends on your role in the market. So let's start first with vacation travelers to Europe. Do they want a strong dollar or a weak dollar against the euro? Travelers will be using the money of the country they're traveling to, so they need euros. Think what a strong dollar means. A relatively big pile of euros for a relatively small number of dollars. Good for the traveler or bad for the traveler? Right, it's good. Another way a traveler might say it is that her money goes a long way. So, we got one vote for a strong dollar. What about exporters? An American insurance company selling policies in Europe, a corporate farm, or a company training mechanics in Saudi oil fields. Do they want a strong dollar or a weak dollar? First question, is the exporter the one who has to go to the currency market? No. Remember, he's the seller and transactions are conducted in the currency of the seller. The exporter will be paid for his product in U.S. dollars. So why would he care about the exchange rate at all? Well, he cares because he knows that the exchange rate can make the cost of his product to international customers go up or down without him changing the price tag at all. And if the dollar is strong, will the foreign customers be able to afford many or few of them? Right, few. So, the exporter would like the dollar to be weaker. He's getting the same competitive price for his product, but now it's easier for the overseas buyers to purchase the dollars they need to pay him for the product. Okay, so now we've got one vote for a weak dollar. Now, as you might have guessed, importers want exactly the opposite of exporters. They have to pay the seller in the seller's home currency, and if the dollar is weak, the importer will have to give up lots of dollars to get that currency. Not good from their perspective. They'd rather have a strong dollar so they can buy the seller's currency at a low price. Now, this picture of the international currency market is also complicated somewhat by governments. The Chinese, for example, don't allow their currency to rise and fall freely on the open market. But we can still summarize the strong dollar, weak dollar comparison in two statements. When the American dollar weakens relative to another country's currency, imports from that country become more expensive for Americans and American exports to that country become cheaper for foreign consumers. When the American dollar strengthens relative to another country's currency, imports from that country become cheaper for Americans and exports to that country become more expensive to foreign consumers. Okay, so the second mechanical feature of international trade that we want to look at is the infamous, constantly talked about, balance of trade. And perhaps the most important and least understood feature of the balance of trade is that it always balances. Yes, really, always. It's an accounting procedure, and it must always balance. The confusion surrounding this point and much of the hysteria about trade deficits arises because we forget or don't know that the balance of payments measures both goods and services, which we call the current account, and financial flows, which is called the capital account. It works like this. This is Pierre, a French baker extraordinaire. On the last day of your once-in-a-lifetime trip to Gay Paris, you took a quick side trip to the Tour Eiffel for one last photo before heading to the airport. As you ran back to your waiting taxi, you passed Pierre's little patisserie and popped in for one last loaf of wonderful French bread. Oh, but alas, you spent all your euros yesterday, knowing you were leaving this morning. Fortunément, P. 
Pierre's dear Cherie accepted his marriage proposal last night and he is feeling most generous this morning. So he takes your U.S. dollars, kisses you on both cheeks, and sends you off to your taxi with your arms full of warm bread. Now, what about your American dollars? Can Pierre take his Cherie to their favorite bistro on the banks of the Seine? Mais non. That bistro does not accept American dollars. He needs euros. What can he buy with American dollars? Well, American things. But other than a used computer being hawked on the sidewalk by an American college student without enough money to get home, there's not a lot of stuff for sale in American dollars in Paris. Now, Pierre could save the money to take his dear Cherie on a honeymoon in America. That way the dollars would come back to the U.S. where they could be spent, but Cherie really has her heart set on Italy. So the third and more likely option is that instead of buying goods and services, Pierre could buy U.S. capital and financial assets like stocks, bonds, or even physical assets like buildings that will stay in the United States. Now, remember that my example is very simplified. It's much more likely that Pierre takes the dollars to the bank and purchases euros with them and goes merrily on his way. But the point remains that those dollars are only good for purchasing American products and assets. And eventually, they'll come back to the United States and the balance of trade will balance. The current account purchase you made in Paris will be balanced by someone else making either a current account or a capital account purchase in the United States. Now remember again, the capital account is made up of investments, physical and financial assets. And keep in mind that American assets are very desirable holdings. The American government is strong and it's never defaulted on its debts. So buying treasury bills, bonds, and notes is a pretty safe investment. The American economy is strong. So although there's no guarantee, buying property and businesses in America is often a profitable investment. In addition, if we have the situation like today, when the U.S. imports more than it exports, there are lots of American dollars in the international currency market compared to demand for them. So they can be relatively cheap to buy. In fact, they could be cheaper to buy and less risky for foreigners than buying financial assets in their own countries. As a result, many foreign individuals, companies, and even governments do buy American assets. Thus, the expenditures for assets bring the dollars back to the United States, and the balance of trade always balances. Okay, now maybe it's easier to think of if you use the term balance of payments and we look at the flow of dollars. Purchases of imports means that dollars flow out, and sales of exports means dollars come back. If more dollars go out for imports than come in for exports, we have a deficit in the current account. This is the trade deficit that's reported in the news. Note that we're just talking about goods and services. What's not being reported is what must happen to those extra dollars that went out for imports and did not come back as payments for exports. Those dollars came back to the United States through the purchase of U.S. financial assets, the capital account. That means that we have a surplus in the capital account when we have a deficit in the current account. We're exporting more financial assets to foreigners than we are importing of their financial assets. And the size of our capital account surplus must equal the size of our current account deficit. If we have a current account deficit, as we do now, we are net importers in the international market. But because we have a current account deficit, we must and do have a capital account surplus. This means that foreigners are net investors in the United States. They are buying U.S. assets as investments anticipating a greater return in the future. In terms of the capital account then, the United States is a net borrower. Foreign purchases of our bonds and other financial instruments are loans that allow us to use their money now and in return we pay them interest. Alright, 
So mechanics aside, is the trade deficit a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know the answer, right? It depends. Right now, the trade deficit reflects a situation where Americans can get goods and services more cheaply from foreign producers, freeing up resources in the United States for other production. That's probably good. But the demand for our exports is low. That's probably not so good if you're an exporter or an export industry worker. The demand for our financial assets is high. That does allow us to borrow for private expansion and government programs at relatively low cost. That could be good. But there's a price to that borrowing. Eventually, the interest will come due and have to be paid. And a big portion of the money for that is going to come from taxes. That doesn't sound so good, especially if we're worried about the future generations that will have to pay the taxes. So, as I said, once again, it depends. And I don't want to pretend to offer a simple answer here. We will provide some readings in the lesson dealing with related issues, such as the question of whether foreign governments, like China, holding American assets is a threat to our national security. Okay. Our only purpose in this lecture has been to define the terms and describe the accounting processes in the hopes of breaking that automatic connection we seem to make between strong dollar good, weak dollar bad, trade deficit bad, trade surplus good. It would be a major step forward if we could meet those assumptions and other inflammatory trade rhetoric with two questions. First, regarding judgments of good or bad when it comes to trade and the strength of the dollar, we need to ask for whom? And second, keeping in mind the consensus that trade creates wealth, we need to ask whether the trade policies being discussed support or inhibit the dynamic of exchange-based specialization and division of labor that we now know generates economic growth and rising standards of living. Fittingly, then, we'll end this lecture and this course, EOFT Part 2, where we started in Part 1. People choose, and institutional rules of the game create incentives that shape choices. Social phenomena like the wealth and poverty of nations, emerge from those individual choices. Improvements in standard of living come from economic growth and voluntary exchange between people within nations and in different nations facilitates the specialization and division of labor that grows the economic pie. As we sum up then, we can make the following generalizations about international markets. Domestic and international trade are fundamentally the same. People choose to trade because they perceive that they will be better off, regardless of where their trading partner happens to live. Trade encourages specialization and division of labor, which lowers costs and increases output. Trade allows people to specialize in their lowest opportunity cost production. So trading relationships based on comparative advantage increased specialization, productivity, and economic growth. The value of a currency in an international exchange emerges from the interaction of suppliers and demanders in currency markets. Changes in the value of currency affect the flow of trade. The trade balance, or balance of payments, is an accounting mechanism providing information about the offsetting flows of goods and services called the current account, and financial assets, called the capital account. It always balances. Summary then, we're back where we started. Voluntary trade creates wealth.